Your newest book, uh, Necessary Illusions, is subtitled Thought Control in Democratic Societies. How can there be thought control in a democratic society such as the United States? Isn't that a contradiction? Well, it depends what you mean by democracy. Uh, if you mean by democracy that uh, ordinary people should have a play a meaningful role in controlling public affairs and determining decisions about how the system works and so on, yeah, then it's a total contradiction. But the point is that elite elements, privileged elite elements, have never meant that by democracy. They've always regarded democracy as a threat, uh, which has to be contained and controlled. And this goes way back to the uh, first democratic revolutions in the 17th century in England. Uh, as soon as it became clear that you're going to lose the, you know, that there would no longer be possible to control people by force. It immediately followed as an almost as a corollary that you're going to have to control what they think. Uh, if you have a what we nowadays call a totalitarian state or a military-run state or whatever, you really don't care much about what people think. They can think anything they feel like uh, because you can control them with a bludgeon. But as the state loses its capacity to coerce through. Uh, threats or terror or just one or another form of force, uh, then other means have to be found to ensure that democracy doesn't work, uh, that, de that democratic forms, in other words, persist, but without interfering with the right of the privileged uh, uh, elements to rule. Now, you know, what the privileged elements are may differ in different societies. In modern capitalist democracies, the privileged sectors are those who own, are the corporate elite, basically. They own the country, more or less. And in fact, more, not less. They effectively own the country, and uh, the and they basically control the political system. But in the United States, this really a one-party state. It's a business party with two factions, uh, and uh, they control the media, the ideological system, and they impose very sharp constraints on any form of policy, any policy that's formulated, even even if the political system ever got out of their control, which is unlikely, it couldn't get very far out because uh, the weapons of uh, capital strike and disinvestment and uh, reduction of business confidence and so on are sufficient to control policy. Uh, so there's, there's lots of mechanisms that ensure that those who own the country govern it. And we should bear in mind that that was the principle of the Founding Fathers, that those who own the country ought to govern it. That's, in fact, a quote from John Jay, the president of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, that's the way the country's founded. Now, the problem is how do you deal with all of this when people are free, as they are, like the state? They can't send in the police to break up this conversation. So how do you deal with that? Well, a lot of mechanisms are used, and one of them, the primary one, is thought control, indoctrination. That's what the phrase necessary illusions comes from. It's uh, not mine. It comes from uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's uh, leading Theologian. He's called the theologian of the establishment. He was the guru for the Kennedy intellectuals and uh, you know, George Kennan and so on, you know, a major figure in modern intellectual history. Uh, and he pointed out once that uh, the ordinary people don't have the capacity, according to him, to become involved in public affairs. Uh, so it's the task of uh, the, what he called the cool observers, meaning us smart guys, it's our task to impose necessary illusions and emotionally potent oversimplifications to keep these poor simpletons on course. Uh, and it would be kind of unfair to let ordinary people, to let the democratic process really work. If you really let ordinary people make decisions or, you know, think about things or whatever, they'd only get in trouble. Uh, it's like letting a three-year-old across the street, you know, it's, it's to the interests of the three-year-old that you constrain them. Uh, and similarly, it's to the interests of the general public that you marginalize them and ensure that the formal political system has not very much substance, uh, because it's only the smart guys, the cool observers, uh, who, uh, are, who uh, have the capacity to make the right decisions. And those, and now it turns out that the cool observers who are in a position to make the right decisions are those who serve the interests of private power. Uh, other cool observers are not cool observers because they have the wrong decisions. He didn't bother mentioning that part. Uh, and, and that's a very typical view. It's not just his view. In fact, it's probably the dominant view. So for example, the, uh, the book that I co-authored right before this one is 
called manufacturing consent, which borrows a phrase from Walter Lippmann, who's the sort of dean of American journalists and major foreign policy critic. Uh, and his view, sort of the same, was that you have to, that's a, it's a crucial part of democracy, he said, is the manufacture of consent. Uh, the population he referred to as the bewildered herd. And he said, we have to save ourselves from the rage and trampling of the bewildered herd. Uh, and since, unfortunately, you can't do it by force, you have to do it by other means. Uh, the other means would be the manufacture of consent. Uh, the United States, uh, the public relations industry in the United States, which goes back to the early part of the century, is dedicated uh, to that. It's a that's a pure business operation, and they're dedicated to it. Everything from, you know, advertising to other mechanisms of influence, and in which they openly call. And there are more honest days they openly call propaganda. And the same is true of much of the intellectual class. Uh, it's uh, it the more sophisticated people recognize that their job is uh, thought control and they have they argue that it's the right thing because the bewildered herd will only get into trouble if you let them rage on by themselves for thought control don't you need to, though, to have a complete control over a system no outside information coming in at all no not really and that's the mistake that dictators usually make uh, dictators are usually much too crude uh, they have a ministry of truth which uh, you know blocks any wrong information. Actually, even in dictatorships, you know, there's usually quite a lot of give, but they have the capacity, at least, to control everything. Uh, our systems don't work like that at all. Uh, in fact, they're probably much more effective because they don't work like that. Uh, they have roughly the same effect, but they convey a sense of freedom. And the sense of freedom is real, like we can do what we're doing. You know, you can have a program in Salem which will, say, tell the truth about Panama. Uh, meanwhile, the three TV channels will be telling corporate government lies about Panama, but you're allowed to compete. That's what's called a free, free market. You know, like if you and I could sit down and decide to open a car manufacturing plant and nobody would stop us from competing with General Motors. Okay, we want to do it, that's fine. You know, police aren't going to stop us. That's a free society. But the effect will be exactly as if the police came in and stopped us. Uh, now, it's roughly the same in this case. You know, 